But this week is love the Lord your God with all of your heart. There are notes there available in your bulletin. And let's go to Matthew 22, 34 to 40. And there are several different accounts in the gospel of this same passage. Mark also uh, speaks to, to this passage as well. And so Matthew 22, though, says 34 to 40, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert of the law, and some of your translations might say a lawyer, tested Jesus with this question. Now, anytime somebody is testing you, they're not necessarily for you. This lawyer, we're not sure if he was for Jesus. In many ways, he was trying to set him up to say the wrong answer. And so this lawyer tests him with this question and says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which one is it? Uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is what the people of God would follow. Scholars would say that there were 613 laws to follow. So the question is, is a good one. I mean, can you help prioritize these for us, Jesus? Which one is the most important out of the 613? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God. Love the Lord, your God. You see, Jesus is not just our Savior, is he? Assuredly, he is. He's our Messiah. He saved us from our sin. But he desires to also be the Lord of our lives. The one who sits at the throne of our heart. He wants to be the pilot of our lives. Love the Lord, your God, uh, with all your heart. All of it. All your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Mark adds, with all your strength as well. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law, all of the Torah and beyond the law, all of what the prophet said, hang, are hinged on these two commandments. So in many ways, Jesus says, this is priority one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. A few points to make about these words of Jesus. Number one, love escapes the divides. Love escapes the divides. Notice what it said in verse 34 and 36. It's the setting of this passage. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees then began to speak up. You see, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were two political religious parties. They had difference of opinion on a variety of things. The Sadducees had already asked Jesus some questions and he answered them to the point where they had nothing else to say. So the Pharisees, of course, thought, hey, we better get into some of the action. We'll send the best one of our lawyers to Jesus with this great question to test him. And the question related to, teacher, which one of the laws out of the 613 laws that are outlined in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which one would be the most important? It's a loaded question, friend. Why is it a loaded question? Because the rabbis of the day would prioritize the 613 laws for people. They would highlight, they would say that some of the, these laws are more of the heavy laws, the more important laws. These other ones are more of the lighter laws. This is the light menu. This is the heavy menu. And so each rabbi had his take on which Law was more important than the others, and they would prioritize a list. And so the question of which one is most important really was in many ways testing Jesus and in many ways about to create divisions for Jesus. 
Because depending on how he answered, some would agree with his list of priority and others would disagree with his list of priority. Because they all had variants of opinion. And so to ask Jesus this question, in many ways, this lawyer was asking him to gain some friends, but to also gain some enemies. Some people who would disagree with his priority list of the laws of the Torah. But you see, love divides love escapes those divides. It escapes those division moments. And Jesus says, well, it's all about love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And everything else from the Torah right on through the prophets hinges on this very point. The love point becomes the overcompassing point out of it all. You see, love becomes... Now hang with me on this point. Love becomes the primary hermeneutical principle for interpreting and applying the scriptures. What hermeneutical means, it's a fancy word to mean when we interpret scripture, when we read it, when we decipher it, when we learn about it, when we study it, and then we apply it, that whole process is partly hermeneutical. And the greatest principle to interpreting and, bo- and applying scripture is love. The reason why I read the scriptures is because I love God. It's because I want to ensure that my life is fully aligned to God's ways. And so when I read in the scriptures about how to manage my sexuality, and I read it, and I hear God say it in the confines of a marriage, I say, God, I love you so much that assuredly, That will be my desire as it relates to my sexuality. When I flip the pages a little more and I read about how God teaches us how to manage our resources. All of a sudden I read it with a heart of love that says, God, of course, I love you with all of my heart. Assuredly, I will respond accordingly with my resources. When I read about the relationship between a husband and a wife and what that's to look like. Assuredly, I then implement that because I love God so much that I want to be the best husband. I want to be part of of nurturing healthy marriages. Why? Because we love God. When I read the scriptures about when it talks, when somebody hurts you or offends you or harms you or, or, or criticizes you, all of a sudden I read God's directive on that and I say, God, I desire your way on that. Why? Because I love you and I want to please you and I want to align my life to you. When I read the scriptures about what the relationship between a parent and a child and a child to a parent, because I love God, I want to do it God's way because I love him with all of my heart. But if you take love out of the equation. If you take love out of the picture, the scriptures simply become a list of do's and don'ts. It simply becomes religion rather than relationship, doesn't it? All of a sudden we read about family dynamics or we read about forgiveness and and we kind of pick certain things and we don't pick other things. Why? Because maybe I'm not wholeheartedly in love with God. I don't desire to do it his way because I've got a divided heart. And think about those who are married in this place. In that relationship, the foundation of its health is going to be love, isn't it? It's love. Because then everything flows out of that love for each other. So that when Sylvia asks me to vacuum... What? Are you kidding me? The garbage needs to go out. What? The dishes need to be cleaned. What? We're going to share our resources? Are you kidding? You see, you take love out of that, everything becomes a struggle, doesn't it? Everything becomes a contract or a give and a take, and, and you get this and I get that. But when love is there, 
There's this sense of, of course, I've dedicated my whole life to you. I've given you my heart. It is but a joy to serve you. You see the love factor? Same goes with our relationship with the Lord. If we start trying to read scripture and interpret it, and you take love out of the picture, it becomes divisive. It divides people up. Our interpretation of certain passages and so on. We take love out of that and we build all sorts of different denominations and different. And I'm not saying it's all bad, but love is the essential point that binds us all together. Our love for God escapes the divides. It doesn't mean that good conversation, challenging conversations can happen where we challenge each other doctrinally and hermeneutically. But it's all under the basis of a love for God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. See, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they divided themselves. They were always looking at how they're different from one another. And Jesus says to them, oh, but it's all about loving your father in heaven with all of your heart. And everything that the Torah says, everything that the prophets have said, all hinge on this very point. See, if you make love, if you take love out of a relationship, it is sadly reduced to fulfilling a list of do's and don'ts. And my prayer for us all, that as we embark in 2015, friend, get a reading plan of the scriptures, read the scriptures every day, but do it because you love God and you so desire to align your entire heart, family, life, marriage, and everything you do to the ways of the Lord. Why? Because you love him. You love him with every ounce of strength and energy, with everything in you. Because love escapes the divides. See, number two, love also encompasses the depths. Love encompasses the depths. Love wants and desires and requires our whole heart. That's why Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And with all your mind, your intellect, with all your soul, your innermost being. Mark adds, with all your strength. Love him with all. The depth of love needs to go so much more than just a surface kind of show up to church kind of love. It goes on all throughout the week and it expresses itself in a community like this on a Sunday morning where we're expressing our love to an amazing God that we serve. Love encompasses the depths. You see, this answer that Jesus gave the Pharisees and the Sadducees that day was actually a quote right out of Deuteronomy 6, chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. It was right out of the Torah. It had already been enlisted and described in, in the early, early times in the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He quotes Deuteronomy 6.5. Now, in Deuteronomy 6.5, the people of God would recite this verse twice every day. Every day, they would literally say this verse out loud. They would say it individually. They would say it as a family. Love the Lord. Joel, today may you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. They would recite it twice every day. You know what else they would do? They would literally put this verse on the door frames of their houses so that whenever they went out, and whenever they would come in, guess what they would read? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't forget that. Put it on the doorposts. They would also have these leather black boxes that they would tie around their arms 
Some would even put them around their foreheads. And so there would be this leather, black, protruding box coming out of their forehead. And inside this box would be verses from the Torah. In particular, this verse. Now, I'm not advocating you should all wear black leather boxes on your foreheads. But, 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 I wonder if we've gone to the other extreme where we have no reminders of us, uh, for ourselves, of what really matters in life. Let's face it, we hit the ground running tomorrow morning. Oh, it's going to be chaos, right? Kids are back in school. If you have children, you're going to go back to the routine. Things are going to get busy. Things are going to get fast. And so I wonder if we need to bring back some reminders that the whole reason, the greatest commandment is to love God with all of my heart. And if I don't have the reminders, I wonder if I am quick to forget what really matters the most in life. I mean, I think about our marriages. We have reminders that we're committed to somebody. Look, I have one right on my finger. It's called a ring, a wedding band. Why do we have wedding bands? As reminders that I have fully committed my life to a wonderful lady named Sylvia. If you come to my home, I've got pictures of our wedding day. They're quite nice. I have a lot more hair in those pictures. It's amazing how fast you can lose your hair. Anyways. But what are those for? They're reminders. Man, that was a special day. And it's only getting better. So we have reminders about our love relationships with our spouses. What about our love for God? I don't know what those reminders can look for you, but if the Old Testament people of God had to have these reminders, then assuredly we should too. If you have to put this verse on your mirror when you wake up in the morning, if you need to put it in your car, if it needs to pop up on your phone every morning, if you need to recite it every lunch hour and every dinner, Find a way because Jesus would want you to know the greatest priority in your life is to love your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Do whatever it takes, friend. Love encompasses the depths. You see, I love the Greek language for many reasons. The Greek language provides us with layers of understanding what love truly means. You know, in the English language, we're limited compared to Greek. We have that one word, love, and it it means a lot of things to a lot of people. The Greek language kind of layers that word and provides other words to describe the depths of love. I'm going to give you a few of these layers of love from the Greek language. The first layer is a word named, uh, a word that is storgy, which means it's a love between a parent and a child, especially between a mother and a child. If you are a parent in this room, in particular a mom, you could have never imagined how much love you could have for this little one, could you? I mean, you would just, your heart when they, when they win in life, you just are so jovial. When they hurt, your heart breaks for them, doesn't it? Why? Because you love them. That's storgy love. Greek gives us that, that layer of love. Then there's a different other love, and it uses a different word. It's phileo love. Phileo uh, love is the kind of love that two best of friends would have. Not a romantic love. It's a friendship love. You ever have those people in your life that when you are with them, you are refueled. You're refreshed. It's not a lot of work to be with them. You feel energized. You feel full. You walk away going, oh man, that was good. I wish I could do that more often. They sharpen you. They challenge you. They inspire you. They encourage you. They cheer you on. That is phileo love. It's a love between friends. There's something beautiful about that, isn't it? It's a biblical kind of love. It's a God-honoring kind of love. It's another layer of love. Then there is yet another layer. It's called, in the Greek, eros. Eros 
is a love of passion that means someone is drawn to another person sexually. Between a husband and a wife where you can have these intimate, loving moments. That is a biblical layer of love. Where a husband and life, a uh, husband and wife can be intimate with one another is a beautiful God honoring thing. It is a layer of love. And then there is yet another layer. Oh, and love, see the depths of love? Here's the word in Greek, it's agape. Agape love, oh, this is an amazing love. In many ways, it is a supernatural love. Agape love is a love that isn't centered in the relationship to the other person or in the attractiveness of the other person, but it is centered on the person who does the loving. So it's this love that isn't given because the other person deserves it or because the other person is attractive or because the other person is our family. It is a love that is centered on the person who gives the love. It's not necessarily the kind of love that even expects reciprocal effect, benefit. It is a love that is given by God. A love primarily based on action Much more than words, it is based on action that is for the benefit of another individual. It is solely for the benefit of the other individual. You see, when you think of stories you love, as you love your children, there most of the time will be this reciprocal, I mean, they're your child. You're going to love your child. You're going to care for your child. There's going to be that relationship with your child for most of the time. You're going to get something out of that. When you think of phileo, the same thing. When you have those friendships, just as you give to that friend, that friend gives back. And it's a beautiful interchange of love between a, a friend and another friend. Then there's that eros love, that love that not only pleases a husband or wife, but also you get pleasure from it. That is the kind of eros love that God has created for us. Agape is different. Agape is so deep. It's so precious. It loves whether the person is attractive or not. It loves whether the person cares about you or not. It loves whether that person has harmed you or not. It's a love that comes from God. It's a love that is expressed with action. It's a gap, a love. The depth of love. You see, that's why Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart. The deepest part of your heart. May you love God without the because. May we love God without the because. May we have such a love for God that, God, even though I might not be rescued from this situation, I will love you just the same. Lord, whether you heal me from this or not, I will love you right to the end. Lord, whether I get this job or not, I love you. It's a deep, Seated love. It's not the kind of love that kind of withers away. It's here one moment, gone the next. It's a love that is solid. It's consistent. It's strong. You see, this love can only be founded in God. There is only one type of love that loves us as is. That is agape love. It is a love that has as its exclusive source, God himself. Agape love loves as is. You ever go to a store and you see something for sale and it says, you got to buy it as is? What does that mean? It means there might be something wrong with it. It might have a little scratch on the corner or it might not have all its parts there. (laughs) And you buy it as is. They're saying, you, you can't refund it and tell us, hey, that part was missing. Or there's this. You buy it as is. And what's our expectation when you buy something as is? You should get a better deal, right? 
should get a cheaper price because you're buying it as is. You can buy cars as is. Have you ever bought a car and it turns into a lemon? Do you know what I mean by that? Sometimes something has gone wrong in the factory and the parts weren't placed right for whatever reason and you buy this car and it's more in the mechanic than it is on the highway. And so it gets deemed as a lemon. So there are laws around this, believe it or not, and you should get your lemons replaced. And they should give you another car in some cases. And if the company wants to resell that car, they have to be clear in saying, this is a lemon, and you buy it as is. Which means it's been in the mechanic shop a lot, and it probably will continue to be in the mechanic shop. But you get to buy it as is at a much reduced cost. So many will say, you know what, I'll take that risk. When it breaks down, I'm good with my hands, I'll fix it. To save that money, to buy a lemon, that's worth it for me. You know what? Here's the spiritual application. God's love, agape love, loves us as is. We have malfunctions that go on in our life, don't we? We have unfaithfulness that sometimes is prevalent in our life. Sometimes we have given God parts of our hearts, but not all of our hearts. But yet, God's agape love loves you and I as is. There's nothing He doesn't know about us. There's nothing, no weakness, no, spirit, uh, no, no sin area in our life that He doesn't know of. And yet, His agape love loves us as is. Think about that. Think about that. Then think about this. Ultimately, His expression of agape love is found in first. Excuse me, 1 John 4, 9, where it says this. This is how God shows his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Ready? Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Do you see that? Not that we loved him. That's, this is agape. We were as is when he loved me and when he loved you. We were yet sinners. Yet he bought us as is. He chose us as is. And you know what? He didn't buy us to get a bargain. He ended up paying top price. He gave his best in Jesus Christ so that he can lavish you and I with the love that is called agape love. That is the depth of God's love for you. He bought you and loves you as is. And he paid top price to be able to do that for you. He wasn't looking for a bargain in the bargain aisle. He was looking to save you because he loves you with a deep love. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? It's amazing. God, you bought me as is. You love me as is. You take a risk in me because you love me. Even though I fail you at times, even though I don't get it right all the time, your agape love floods my heart. What happens when this love comes into our lives and into our hearts? Something transformative happens, doesn't it? When this kind of depth of love comes into my heart, something else should come out of my life now. And that's what I call my third point, which is love envisions the dream. Notice, 
After Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, he then says in verse 39 and 40, and the second is like it, which means he's saying this second one is lived out in parallel, in unison. It is similar to loving the Lord with all your heart is to love your neighbor as yourself. First John 4.12 says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. That is a loaded verse, friend, for a variety of reasons. Love is made complete. If you can put first John up there, friend. That would be great. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. So if you want to know whether you are a true follower of Christ, is when you prove it by loving your neighbor. You know the true fruit of somebody's heart when they are able to love their neighbor. You might say, who's my neighbor? Somebody asked Jesus that question. Your neighbor is anybody, friend, who you come in contact with or intersects your path. Love your neighbor as yourself. When we love each other, it is a true, pure, and most sincere sign that you are a follower of Christ. That is the true way to signify that something has happened in your heart. That you will love your neighbor even though your neighbor might not love you. You will love your brother even though your brother has slandered you. You will love your sister even though she has harmed you. Because the love that is agape has been poured into your life. And so it, as it has poured into your life, it needs to ooze out of your life. It's kind of like Christmas lights. Christmas lights, I love Christmas lights, but man, I feel like they're my worst enemy too. Especially those strings of lights that are made to be a set of lights. So you know how this works. The power, the electricity comes into the light bulb, through the filament, down through the light bulb, down through the wire, into the next light bulb. Through the filament, through down into that light bulb, down the wire, into the next light bulb. And the set continues. If there is something wrong with one of those bulbs... It throws everything off, doesn't it? Well, it's very similar with the love of God. You see, the love of God comes into our lives, into our lives, into the deep recesses of our hearts. This agape love that loves us even yet when we were still sinners. And it beams up our hearts. But we were wired to also release it onto the next person. When we don't do that, things begin to malfunction. Friend, God has wired us to receive the love of God, but he has also wired us to pass it along to others. Jesus is saying that getting and giving love, getting and giving love is the greatest evidence that a person is a Christ follower. Getting and giving love is sure evidence that somebody is a Christ follower. It is in those very moments when we, in many ways, have every right to disown and discredit and to criticize that we stop and we love and we protect a reputation and we repay evil with good because it's the Jesus way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's why Jesus later on in John 13, 34, and 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, love one another just as I have loved you, love one another. And as you love one another, 
In this way, they will know that you are my disciples. You see, the love of God that is given to us is only half the story. The way the love of God is made complete, as we read in 1 John, is when we begin to love others. Then the love of God has come full circle. It has been made complete. That is the dream that is envisioned with this passage. That we would not only be receivers of the love of God, but may we be conduits of the love of God. With that same depth of agape love, and let's face it, I can't do that on my own strength. I don't have it in me. I need supernatural help by the Lord to exhibit agape love, the same kind of love that God exhibited to me. I conclude with this as the worship team comes. A picture of this amazing love. There's a gentleman by the name of Jean Vanier. He was the founder of a community called Larch Communities. It's a community that takes care of individuals with severe disabilities. And he goes on to say a story of one of the 76-year-old ladies in their community named Mammy. Mammy had serious mental and physical disabilities. She was blind, she was bedridden, she was mentally limited, she couldn't feed herself, she couldn't dress herself, she was unable to communicate through words, and yet the entire staff at Larch Community followed the words of Scripture and showed her Christ-like love. They showed her, in essence, an agape love, the kind of love that they didn't expect to ever get returned because she just wasn't able to. And yet they loved her every day. They dressed her, they bathed her, they fed her every day. But showing unconditional love wasn't always easy. In fact, one of the staff assistants, a young, a young man named Louise, was assigned to take care of Mammy. And Louise was disappointed because he didn't feel drawn to her. Faithfully, as he was asked, he fed Mammy, but he found it tiresome. Then one day, Mammy placed her hand on his hand and she smiled at him. It was the very first time that Louise had seen anything come back to him for all that he had done and it changed everything for him. It was, he said, a special meeting, a moment of transformation, a moment of grace. From that moment on, he loved being with her. What he had found tiresome and difficult became a blessing. Love made all the difference. And then one day, a woman came to visit the director of that same large community. And as the visitor watched Mammy struggle through life, she was weak, she was blind, she was voiceless, she was powerless to feed or dress herself. She offhandedly asked the director, what's the point of keeping Mammy alive? What's the point to this? It went quiet. The director looked down, thought for a moment, and then responded this way, well, Madam, because we love her. It's because we love her that we do this. It's because we love her that we dress her, that we feed her, that we care for her, that we speak on her behalf. It's because we love her. Now, as I thought about that story, I thought in many ways, some would say, God, why do you even bother with the human family? I mean, it's a mess. And we, we mess all the time. We make a mess all the time. Like, why even bother? Why even bother with churches? Why even bother with people in the community? Because he loves you. <laughs> it's because he loves you. 
He loves you, friend. That he was willing to purchase you just as you are. But he loves you too much to keep you that way. He wants to transform your life. And he's wired you not only to get his love, but to give it. And that's what enables God's love to be perfect and whole and powerful. And so if we are recipients of this amazing agape love that loves us just as we are, as is, God has called us as a community to love others as is, to love each other as is, with all of our idiosyncrasies, with all of our differences, love escapes the divides. Love encompasses the depths. Love envisions a great dream where people can see God in us because it radiates through us. Friend, as you embark in 2015, Priority one, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. 